second degree mason uh, I know you've been taught that masonry goes to 33 and 34 degrees for grand masters the reason I'm a 92nd degree mason is because in 1988 I broke the math interface in all 5,000 languages proving that language is a linear equation in algebra this hasn't been done in 8,500 years of written language when I did so I was able to unlock the two-thirds of all the words missing from all languages in the world, and I can write any sentence in any language frontwards and backwards with the same meaning. Once this was discovered, it completely, uh, 48 hours after I published on the internet, I had two secret service agents from Washington at my front door going, do you realize what you've done? You've just disqualified every treaty, trust, and contract in 8,500 years on planet Earth. I says, well, uh, he says, who did you tell? I says, everyone. I says, I sent out uh, 100 videos, 20 hours long, including a 100-page report on the entire studies to all nations of the United Nations and over 100 TV and news agencies around the United States. By doing that, I protected myself because when you have a secret that is so profound that it would disqualify planet Earth, it would cause you to get shot. <laughs> and at every seminar, at, by the end of the seminar, there's always a dozen people that walk up to you and say, why are you still walking around? Well, as Pandora, uh, uh, destroyer of worlds. Now, you might think that that's a bad thing. The word destroyer, D-E means no, and destroy is contract. Of is an adverb which connects to a pronoun in front of it. P-R-O means no, N-O means no, and U-N means no. So the word destroyer is a no, no, no word. Of is an adverb, A-D-V. It's a modifier. Modifiers connect the pronouns in front of it and modify the verb after it. Modification is change. Change is motion. Motion is action. And action is verb. Therefore, the word world becomes a verb. Do you live in a world of verb or do you live in a world of a fact? As you all know, the, world is a, the word world is a fact. But because it's the destroyer of verb, I destroyed the world of verb in all 5,000 languages worldwide on April 6th, 1988. And so with that said, how did this come about? Well, in 1980, I went through a divorce. And in the divorce, Judge Stanley Miller said, you cannot uh, be a father to your children. And he took away my children. I'm going, why would you do that? I've been a good father for 10 years. And he goes... Because I'm a judge, he says, and I can take away people's children just because I can. He says, well, that's sex discrimination under the 1964 Civil Rights Act for Equality. Uh, I says, I'm going to prosecute you. And he says, you can't prosecute judges. He says, big the difference. I says, I know what the law is. You swore to support the Constitution of the United States and the laws written by the United States Congress, Senate, and Legislature. I says, that includes equality. I says... If I don't have equality, that's discrimination. Pretty simple. So I, I prosecuted Judge Stanley Miller in 1980, and he was disbarred as a judge. Six year, seven years later, Stanley Miller got reappointed again. Two weeks later, after he was reappointed, I showed up in his courtroom. Had him disbarred again. Four days later. Was, <laughs> seven years later, 1994, got reappointed again. And... Uh, I uh, showed up in his courtroom two weeks after he got reappointed. Had him disbarred a third time. Three years later, he died in 1997. 
and uh, never served much on the bench. Always was an administrator, but never a, a judge. In, uh, in, as, as a result of that, when the judge took away my children, that violation, that breaking of my heart, put me on a path. And that path was anger. You don't take away a, a parent's child. And the, the pain that that caused, pain makes thought, thought makes wisdom, and wisdom grows to maturity. So as a result of that pain, I started studying. Now, we go through three phases in life. You do not know what you do not know. Well, it's like putting your hand in fire. It looks pretty until you touch it and you get burnt. Well, you know what you don't know about why you got burnt. And I was aware of what I didn't know, so I had to study. And so because I studied, I learned about what, what the fire was. I learned about what the pain was. And from that, I then had knowledge. And when I had knowledge, I knew what I knew. And then I could become a teacher. In 1975, I became a college professor in Milwaukee. And I was uh, taught engineering and uh, metallurgy, heat treating, and blueprint reading. So I've been a teacher now, 30, so 75, so going on 38 years. An old uh, professional license for college. I also have three PhDs and 535 college credits, 17 full-time years of college. Kind of got stuck in college. I really liked it. I worked third shift nights as a tool and die welder. And I went to school full-time days. I had my, and but to fill in my spare time because I didn't sleep, um, I went ahead and had a second full-time job. And that was in real estate, teaching underwater welding. I uh, had my own real estate company for 26 years, besides doing law from 1980 to present time, 32 years. I have 80,000 hours of law experience. And uh, I fielded, uh, I've done 2,500 seminars, including uh, over 1,000 TV and radio live performances. I did the programs on 9-11 on national television on what really happened there. Uh, there's only a few people in the world that have my background and credentials about what heat treating is, nuclear science, string threes and quantum physics. I have a 200 IQ. I read 400 words a second in math codes. It's uh, something that's uh, acquired art. Uh, you can give me an inch of paper and I'll, of documents and I'll blow through it in about a minute. And I'll be able to tell you exactly about how many mistakes are in it and then what to do about it. The uh, the program today is going to cover many different aspects. So I'm going to go through uh, the parts of speech, which I wrote up here. It took six years of my life to discover this. It isn't really what you think it is. And what they teach you in school is not what you actually, uh, is actually what's going on. And I'm, this isn't to insult anybody, but all of you have a second grade reading level. And it isn't just you, it's the entire population of the planet was instructed and, and through TV, radio, newspapers, and magazines to keep you in a second grade reading level because that way they could harvest the entire population of the planet. There is a few individuals called federal judges and uh, chief federal judges at a state level. They control the, what's called, parse syntax grammar and the secrets therein. When I broke the code in 1988, I went to the United States Supreme Court. I walked in there in 1989, and they says, I'm here to prosecute William Rehnquist, Chief Supreme Court Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Immediately, I was arrested for threatening the United States Supreme Court judge. And Thank you for the likes. Room. Well, when we got down in that room, I had six marshals standing shoulder to shoulder around me, and... William Rehnquist came down from up in his chambers to see me, and I says, I have your signed confession for treason against the United States people. I says, I've, syntax, I've used parse syntax grammar against your opinion uh, since you've been in office. He says, okay, guys, you can all leave now. Mr. Miller and I are going to sit in this closed room. Uh, you've already frisked him. He has no weapons. He doesn't seem to be of stature that can tend overpower me. And we're going to have a little discussion. So for the next two and a half hours, William Rehnquist and I became very good friends. And uh, 
further than that until he died and I removed him from office in June of 2005. We were pretty good friends. I taught him syntax, the math interface on grammar. He taught me all the secrets of the procedures of judges. But a lot of the things he taught me, he was in error of because two-thirds of all the words were missing from the procedures by which he wanted to formulate answers. Now, believe it or not, we are all actors in a play that have been already written. All of you believe that you have a certain amount of, of choice to make in life. But the fact is, uh, and I will do this later this afternoon when we get into some history programs, that we are on timetable. I can tell you <clears throat> what he means by two-thirds <clears throat> of the words we're missing. If you know quantum grammar, then you know that it consists of position lodial fact phrases. That's three words. Positionals, lodials, and facts. And in plain English fiction babble, which is grammar modification, they don't use position, lodials, and facts. They use adverbs, verbs, adjectives, and pronouns. So the positionals and the lodials are missing from fiction grammar is basically what he's saying, two-thirds of the words. Instead of for the words, someone would just put the words, which is adverb, verb. For the words is position, lodial, fact, five, six, seven. And again, this is, you know, intermediate level stuff. Uh, not, not really for beginners, but if you watch the nine-hour seminar, you'll, you'll catch it. Most of it anyways. Timetables that run on seven-year international, uh, on domestic bankruptcies and 70-year international bankruptcies. These bankruptcies control the planet for the last 6,500 years in all countries. All countries worldwide are controlled by the post office. Not the courts, not the judges, not the kings and queens, but the postmasters of the world run the entire planet, have for 6,700 years. Going all the way back to Pharaoh. Henceforth the Masons. Now, a lot of you um, were in this room today. A room is a closed area, so therefore it's a court. I'm going to show you a dollar bill here, which you're all familiar with. And on the back of the dollar bill, you have the eagle, right? Notice the eagle's wings are turned up. If you notice the eagle's wings here are turned down. That's because it's a phoenix. This is Vatican rule. Banking. And the flag here has yellow fringe on it. And the yellow fringe flag has a, changes the dimension of the flag. This is a maritime braid for commerce. The fringe changes the description of the flag. It's under Army Regulations 840-10, Chapter 2-6. Allows for fringe to be put on military flags for parades. But anything you put on top of the flag cancels the contract of what a flag is. So even though you think you're looking at a United States flag, United, UN means no, and ITE is citizen. A no citizen's condition of state flag controlled by Vatican banking. You're all under commerce. So who's the Vatican? They're postmasters. They work with Bern, Switzerland through the Universal Postal Union. On the 29th of September, 2009, I did a seminar in Auckland, New Zealand. In that seminar, there were... As a side note, he just said, postmasters run the world. Um, and they're in Switzerland. So the people that rule the world or run the world are in Switzerland, and they're postmasters. This is what David Wynn Miller is saying in this video. To corroborate that, I invite you to Google Dr. Sean Haross, H-R-O-S-S. Who has a couple YouTube channels out there and a lot of interesting videos talking about the people that rule the world live in Switzerland. He doesn't say anything about postmasters, but he talks about Pharaoh, which is what Miller just said, going back to Pharaoh, postmasters all the way back to Pharaoh, hence masonry, blah, blah, blah. 
And then we can get into Templars and Jesuits and all these types of things. Where would be the perfect place to rule the world from? From a neutral country like Switzerland. No one can attack it. No one can go there. So therefore, that's the safest place for the quote-unquote elite, postmasters, whatever you want to call them. Just draw that to your attention, little breadcrumbs for you to figure out what's really going on on this uh, plane here. 90 Auckland tribal chiefs of the 1,200 tribal chiefs that live in New Zealand. I then made a statement to the post office since 1800 has never had a correct parse syntax grammar law, rule, regulation, or code in any language with any people on planet Earth. As a result of that, 72 hours later, three days, the United States Postal Service, which since 2000 has had a quantumized postal treaty with myself and Russell Gould, my business partner, two of us make corporate. Thank you for the share. On the 28th, on the 20. 7th of August 1999, I sued the United States of America for the flag of the United States. I filed a new quantumized mathematical patent on the description of the flag of the United States, 1 to 1.9. And he used a correct grammar called parse syntax grammar. As a result of that, on August 12, 1999, I owned the patents to the flag of the United States of America. And on August 13th, all flags had yellow fringe put on it because it had to change the dimension of the flag. Now, I don't know if you remember in 1968 when the astronaut, for those of you that are old enough, and I don't think there's a whole lot of you here that are old enough, <laughs> uh, the, the astronaut stepped off his spacecraft into his footprints on the moon, on, on the moon turned around, looked at Earth, and says, Oh, look at Earth is a vessel in a sea of space. And that with, that with that one single sentence, Earth is a vessel in a sea of space, that's maritime. The entire world put yellow fringe on every flag in all 250 countries, in every courtroom, in church, and, and office, making everything on planet Earth maritime. Maritime is controlled by the DOT, Department of Transportation, which is controlled by the United States. By Kevin Broder, what is hashtag BCCRSS? What, what does that mean? The Postal Service Worldwide, Bern, Switzerland. Bern, Switzerland was established on the 22nd of October, 1871, in Hawaii. It was the first city, first country, as an independent nation, to sign an international bankruptcy with Bern, Switzerland, for two cents to transport cargo anywhere on planet Earth. And as a result of that, within a period of a year, all 250 countries for, two, for a two-cent postage stamp signed up to be, give the post office authorization to transport vessels for a two-cent postage stamp. Well, as you know, think people were thinking of mail to send a letter. A letter is a vessel. Well, the word vessel includes cars, trains, planes, automobiles, Overland stagecoaches, pony expresses, and human beings. And by doing so, they then captured all commerce on planet Earth by contract for a two cent postage stamp. A year later, it went up to a buck a, buck a letter. But they got their foot in the door, and that was all that was necessary. Somebody left a little tiny article sitting on a, on a, new, on a, on a, in a newspaper in January 8th, 1872 on a microfish dish in, in Honolulu, Hawaii, in, in the Iolani Palace, Iolani Palace Museum Archives building. Hightower and I went into that building that day, and we wanted to look for a flag of Hawaii. And they said, we guarantee there is no information in this building from 1869 through 1875. And I'm going, now, why wouldn't there be anything? Uh, Hawaii's the center of the Pacific. Anything moving from east to west and west to east has to stop at Hawaii to get coal, C-O-A-L, or fuel, as everything ran on steam back then. So Hawaii then became the center of the entire Pacific Rim, hub to a wheel. Very, very important location. And by doing so, that started a 
a series of events through the Universal Postal Union to capture the entire planet, throw the entire world into a postal zone. And this little tiny article, as it was put into place, uh, was left there. Nobody thought anything of it. Well, we did find a flag on the newspaper that had eight stripes instead of seven. But there was also a little square, three inches by four inches, with the obituary. The obituary of the uh, Portuguese Masonic Eye, the French Masonic Eye, the German uh, uh, scale, and the English scale. So now we had a ordering all Masons in the Hawaiian Islands to come to Honolulu, Hawaii, to pay homage to King Kamehameha V, who died on the 6th of December. I'm telling you a story because it is wrong. I see that BCCRSS has something to do with it's illegal to use a legal name or some such nonsense like that. But I don't understand what BCCRSS means. Kevin Broder, could you please uh, clarify that for me since you put it in the chat? I don't know what that, I don't know what B stands for, what C stands for, C, you know, I, I want to know what the letters stand for exactly. I know it has to do with the birth certificate system, but what, what does that exactly stand for? Or does anybody else out there know if uh, Kevin doesn't know? Does anybody else out there have any answers? to the beginning of the takeover of planet Earth. As a result of this, uh, it takes a steamer three days to go from Honolulu out to Kona and Hilo and back again. So three plus three is six. January 8th and 6th is January 14th. January 14th, all the Masons get together with the post office, Immigrations and Customs, the Supreme Court of Hawaii. Guess what building they're all in? They're all in the same building directly across from the Queen's Palace in Hawaii. Immigrations, Customs, the head, uh, Lodge Number One for the Masons, the Postmaster General of Hawaii, all in the same building. <laughs> And they cut a treaty. The treaty says that uh, there was, in 1848, a law was passed in Hawaii that if Hawaiians are dead or off the land for 20 years, the land is free for settlement. So they went ahead and the Masons signed this contract to take over the Hawaiian Islands. Now there's a law called the Rescissions Act. It was, goes all the way back to the Civil War. Rescissions Act says that no law becomes legal for three days. And this three-day notice, if you ever look at when contracts are signed, even when you all did your mortgages, either bought property or sold property, you couldn't put, pick up a check in your closing for three days. That's because of the Rescissions Act. That's Title 15, Section 1636 and 1639. Now, the Rescissions Act then went into effect on the 17th of January, 1872 put a 20-year moratorium on it. It's January 17, 1893, when the United States took over the Hawaiian Islands. For those who don't know anything about the Hawaiian Islands, takeover. Except it wasn't the United States of America that took over the Hawaiian Islands. It was the military, and the military is controlled by the post office. It was the United States Postal Service that took over the Hawaiian Islands. Now, as a result of this takeover, the injustice that people were a victim of went out there and sued the state court. The state court says, we don't have jurisdiction. You're in the wrong place. So the Hawaiians then went to federal court. They walked into federal court, United States District Court, and the district court said, you're in the wrong place. We don't have jurisdiction over you. You're a sovereign people. So they went to the United States Supreme Court, Washington, D.C. United States Supreme Court, Washington, D.C. You're in the wrong place. You sued the wrong people. They're going like, all right, we're being victimized. They stole our land. Who's guilty? So from 1890, September, uh, January 17th, 1893, all the way up until January 6, 2009, nobody knew who was guilty. As a result of that, because I'm a Mason, and I syntax Manly Hall's The Secret of All Nations, 
with masons throughout the history of this Secret world, of all ages, you mean. Secrets of all ages. There's only five copies on planet Earth. Se I own one Secret of teachings of all the ages. And when I send tax that book, that book is 18 inches tall, one foot wide, and two inches thick. It's now six inches thick because of all the missing words were put back into it. It covers everything on the planet, every religion, uh, the tarot cards, uh, witchcraft, uh, grammar, all the parts of speech, parse, how words come together. It's got all the secrets in it. But the secrets were only written in adverb verb, not prepositional phrases. So when I, when I rewrote it with the correct parse syntax grammar, I then had missing secrets. I did the same thing to the, to the Quran for the Muslims, and I did it to the Bible, King James Bible. I was able to discover the secrets putting me as the chief federal judge of the United States of America, prosecuting judges for the past 32 years. That's what I do. I prosecute judges. I'm the bad boy. <laughs> as a result of this, the reason I told you this is because everybody wants you to walk into the state court. Well, state is undefined. You live in the state of Indiana, right? That's not a true statement. You live in the Indiana Territory. The state of Indiana is the name of the vessel in dry dock called your courthouse. All courthouses are foreign vessels in dry dock controlled by the Department of Transportation. In other words, the port authorities control vessels in dry dock. All judges in the United States and all courthouses are paid by the port authorities. That's a very big secret. The Port authorities are controlled by the DOT, Department of Transportation, which is owned by the post office, which owns the treasury and the military, and prints the money and pays the military to guarantee the value of the money. The United States District Court, United means no city. Thank you, dollar sign, gone digital 80, for that. So B, C, C? RSS stands for BIF. <laughs> I think you mean birth. Birth certificate. Well, what's the third? What's the second C? BCC. Oh, so it would probably be birth certificate. Clausula ribus sic stantibus. Who's mixing Latin with English? That's interesting. It's illegal to use a legal name. Gone Digital 80. Just putting logic on the table here. Does that sound logical to you? How can something be illegal if it's legal? Like if you have a legal name, how is it illegal to use a legal name? That's like saying it's illegal to use a legal driving license. It's illegal to use a legal firearm. This terminology, I mean, it sounds catchy when you first read it, but it makes absolutely no freaking sense on a logical scale that it's illegal to use something that's legal. Or conversely, it can be legal to use something that's illegal. What sense does that make? To me, it makes absolutely zero sense. That's why I teach correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, because you don't have to deal with legalities. You don't have to deal with law, legal. All that stuff is fiction, bullshit, nonsense. You can just uh, pretty much bypass that stuff, navigate over top of it. It's not really anything to be concerned about when you have closure on quantum grammar. But that. Uh, thank you for... Uh, posting that comment, so now, now I have a better idea what it means. Thank you very much. State is a condition of district. D-I-S means demon god of the underworld for T-R-I-C-T, -T, trickery. This is Latin. In a closed area called court. So when you walk into the United States District Court building, you are in a vessel, a foreign vessel in dry dock. Could be a spaceship from any planet, but not from Earth. So you've left planet Earth. You are no longer in the territory of Indiana. Now, all the, all the laws written in Indiana for Indiana people do not apply in a foreign vessel in dry dock. You speak a foreign language called Babel. 
You are a foreign entity. And as a federal judge, when you walk in front of me, what do I have in front of me? Do I have a document that is actually says something, or is it written in adverb verb by babbling attorneys and lawyers? What I have in front of me are your vessels, your body. Hold a thought in your hand. Show me the three-dimensional object of a thought. Do you know that a thought is not of this world? A thought isn't found on the periodic table. It's not a solid, it's not a liquid, it's not a gas, it's not a chemical. And yet we all have thoughts. It's an energy, comes from our aura, electrical chemical energy, but it is not of this world. A thought can pierce dimensions, can, can, can change through time and space. I can hold the entire known universe, which they say is supposed to be 8.4 billion years old from the Big Bang, in the palm of my hand with a thought. Or I can crawl inside the middle of a quark of a hydrogen atom and exist there with a thought. So a thought... I feel like a visual of Spongebob <clears throat> with his hands over his head doing that rainbow thing saying, Imagination. It's pretty much what David's talking about there. Uh, Gone Digital says, of the contract. Well, right off the bat, if you look at the word contract, it has a particle of negation in it. C-O-N-T-R-A. Contra. As in contradiction. And an ACT means contract. So contract means no contract. That is why I did a salvage of the word contract. And I hyphenate the word contract, C-O-N hyphen T-R-A-C-T. So it means together along the same tract. That's why I hyphenate that word, because that is correct sentence structure. Read what I said before. I did read what you said. I think. Hold on. Uh, you didn't really say anything. You just said, uh, Bith certificate fraud clausula ribis blah blah blah. You said that, and then you said, Mean it's illegal to use a legal name. And I said, That's not logical. How can something be illegal if it's legal? That's like saying something's unlawful if it's lawful. It's a contradiction, it doesn't make sense, it's a fallacy. Uh, of the contract, if you're here to learn correct sentence structure, if you're interested in correct sentence structure, one would not begin a sentence with of the. Every correct sentence structure must start with for the. You have a cause, concern, verb, possessive, concern, possessive, authority. That's how correct sentence structure goes. That's how the mathematical interface goes. One plus two equals three. Three minus two equals one. The positionals serve the function of the plus and the minus in that equation I just gave you. That's how the mathematical uh, interface is certified. So you would never say of the whatever. It's always for the. So you would say for the con hyphen tract, period. That's exactly it. So, if we're using correct grammar and we're looking at what you're writing, for example, that's exactly it. That is a non-tangible contract pronoun followed by a non-tangible contract adverb, which is exactly because the L-Y in the word exactly kills the tangibility of the word. And then it would be a dangling participle verb. So, it's a pronoun adverb verb scenario. That's grammar modification. This is what David Wood Miller has been talking about. As far as babble, which is what you're using in the comments field, plain, simple English babble, which, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what we, I'm using right now to verbalize what I'm saying. Um, I'm just putting it in the context of quantum grammar. That's all. Legal actually holds no contract. Legal is you accepting the illegal contract. Now, see, that doesn't tell you had the beginning I mean, everything is contract. Everything is contract. Whether it's babble or whether it's fact. It depends what domain it is in. Legal as you accepting the illegal contract is not correct. 
in the context of correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. There is no such thing as legal or illegal. A contract is a contract. You mean what you say, you say what you mean. You perform on it. In the fiction, that's completely different. It's grammar modification. So the stuff you're kind of getting into has more to do with the fiction system. Like maybe, for example, common law or, or things like that. Which, by the way, common law is also fiction babble. It's all part of the fiction system. It's just another tentacle of it. Correct sentence structure is completely different. You are allowing them to illegally put a contract with you on you. Well, I mean, if you want to participate with legalities, that's up to you. I don't participate with legalities. I participate with the facts. Contract is by consent. And, I mean, I know what you mean by hustle, but with correct sentence structure, there is no such thing as hustle, trickery, or anything like that. It's so straightforward. It is so straightforward that the fiction system wants nothing to do with it. Actually, it is very easy in court because if you have closure on grammar, if you have closure on the grammar you're using and you know it well enough to cheat someone else on the spot, you, in a manner of speaking, take jurisdiction over the court. You void all the boxes and planes. There is no higher authority than you in the well of the court when you're using that 1 by 1.9 grammar flag. There is no higher authority in that court than you. And the doc, I mean, the document that you're carrying, that you are a postmaster of, that you are a federal judge of, you are the bank banker of. Authority comes from author. If you're going to be an authority of something, you better be the author of it. Get it? Authority, the word author is in it. Author means to create something. You authorize something. You write it. That's why it's so important to have closure on the grammar when you're doing these things. Well, gone digital 80, I do empathize with you being put in jail. However, I have to say that I'm, I'm pretty sure that you did not use correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. <clears throat> Because again, if you don't have closure on what it is you're doing, it's probably not going to turn out the way you think it will. Actually, and just being straight up with you, they don't hide anything from you. I have never run into a Vasily, a judge, an attorney, anybody who knew correct sentence structure. They may have known of it, they may have heard of it, but they don't know it. As far as I know, they don't. I've never met one judge, attorney, or, or clerk that knows correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. I've been teaching this stuff for over six years now, okay? To hundreds of people all over the earth. Out of those hundreds of people, I probably have a good solid 12 people who actually have closure on the grammar and can actually use it. Know it well enough to teach someone else and keep themselves safe navigating through foreign vessels and dry dock. 12 people out of six years. That's a very low percentage because not everybody possesses the gumption and the willpower and basically the cojones to learn this. It takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. A lot. And a lot of humility, beyond a shadow of a doubt. If you're not prepared to humble yourself and realize you don't know what you don't know, then you're probably going to have problems learning this stuff. Corruption is, um, for me, in my view, corruption is when someone does something they know is wrong or they know is going to hurt someone or have an unfair advantage or whatever, that is corruption. There are a lot of people that are employed in the legal system <clears throat> that that's all they know. They don't know that it's How can I put this? They have children. They have mothers and fathers. They have brothers and sisters. They have grandchildren. They have families. And they have jobs. 
And I personally think that they don't know what they don't know. Not everybody in that system is corrupt. By what I think you mean by corrupt. There definitely are a lot in that system that are corrupt. But there are some that are not. They're just ignorant. If that's the case, it holds no value if the people you're pleading to don't understand. I completely agree with that. That is why I keep saying, and I've said it at least two times already, you have to know it well enough to be able to teach it to someone else. When you walk into a foreign vessel in dry dock, if they speak Russian in that foreign vessel in dry dock and you only speak English, it is contingent upon them to give you a translator so that you understand what's going on. Someone has to, they, it's their responsibility to do that for you. Because you don't speak Russian. You only speak English. They have to give you a translator. It's the same thing with correct sentence structure. When you create your own document, contract, postal vessel court venues, you have to be able to translate that to the people you're talking to. If you walk into a foreign vessel and dry dog, i.e. a fiction court, and you're using this, you have to be able to teach it to them on the spot. You have to be able to explain what an adverb is, what a verb is, what an adjective is, what a pronoun is, what a positional is, what a lodio is, what a fact is, what a conjunction is. You have to be able to explain all those things on the spot. Basically put on a seminar. You have to be prepared to do that. If you're not, then I agree. It's of no value because you didn't put any value into it. You don't know what you're talking about, so therefore it has no value to anybody else. If it doesn't have value to you, you see what I'm saying? What's worse, ignorance or corruption? Corruption. For sure, corruption. Because that's willful. There is corruption in every, every government branch. Every department. Everything. There is corruption. There is no doubt about it. I'm not ready to assume and presume that everyone is corrupt, though. I think a lot of people are just caught up in a situation that they don't, uh, they don't really know how to navigate a way out of it. Because, see, the thing is, if you're going to present a problem, you have to present a solution for rule one, rule equal. So maybe someone has a job and they get the vague feeling that what they're doing is not right. But they don't have a solution. Like, they don't have an alternative. Because maybe that's all they know how to do. How are they going to feed their family if they quit their job? As a government employee or whatever. How, what are they going to do? What are they going to do for quote-unquote insurance or, you know, all these other things? It's, it's, a, it's a sticky situation. One solution is to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, and then you can be a steward of your contracts and tow a lot of things as salvages. You can be correct and also still maintain a modicum of normalcy in your life. It's much easier to stay in this game than it is to learn about this, let alone study the language. Kevin Broder, I agree. I agree, it's just easier. People are going to do what's easier, for sure. Path of least resistance. If you don't have a reason to learn quantum grammar, you're not going to learn it. Most people wait until it's too late. And then all of a sudden, they're in the desperate to learn it. Those are the types of people that email me and... Uh, they're in the middle of having their house taken or their children taken away or something, and, and they think that I can magically step in and help them, which is not the case. I'm a grammar tutor. I can teach them grammar. I can teach them and give them the tools to help defend themselves and keep themselves safe. But I'm not someone that, that's like uh, the equivalent of a quantum grammar attorney or something that can solve their problems. Because if you think about how much an attorney makes per hour or on retainer, take that and multiply it by three or four times, and that's how much you would have to pay a quantum grammar 
uh, individual to take on a case. It's a lot more work. That's why I say learn it yourself. If you really want to learn it, learn it. Don't be lazy, bro. Learn it. Better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. The way to beat the system. Well, here's the thing. Take that mentality and turn it on its head, I suggest. Turn that mentality on its head. It's not a, it's not a competition. There's no beating the system. Trust me, all right? That's funny when people say, trust me. I am, I'm automatically suspicious when someone says, trust me. So apologies for that. But I can tell you, no one is going to beat the system. The system is the system. It has the bigger guns and clubs. What happens when you learn the grammar is that the system learns to leave you alone. And if you consider that beating the system, well, then I guess you can consider that a win. But I look at it this way. It stops the trespass. It stops people from being screwed over. It stops people from being harassed. And that's about as good as it gets. There is no going after the system because if you try to go after this system, it's a beast and you don't, you don't have an army. How, how do countries get conquered? Like what's going on in the Middle East or what happened in North America when the settlers came or what happened to Europe when the crusaders came? They conquered because they had an army. You and I don't have an army. We just have ourselves and our grammar and our volition. So there is no beating the system. The best positive result is that the system leaves you alone and you're able to do whatever, pretty much whatever you want to do, free and unencumbered. That's pretty good for me. I told the judge I know he wasn't working in his original capacity under his constitutional oath. See, I would never do that. I would never say something like that. Because it's not up to me to assume what a judge is because I'm not a fiction judge in the capacity that he is. The only way you can tell someone how to do their job usually is if you do the job yourself. If you've done the job. That judge you're talking about has been to law school for at least seven years or more. They know their system. They know their own system. So for someone else to come in and tell them how to do their job, it's kind of, it doesn't make sense to me. And as far as constitutional oaths, what does the Constitution, think about this logically for a minute, what does the Constitution have to do with anything? Is your name on the Constitution? Did you autograph the Constitution? Did you authorize it? Are you a part of that contract? Well, if the answer is no, well, then it has nothing to do with you. It's assumed that it pertains to you, just like it's assumed that the birth certificate pertains to you. But you didn't autograph the birth certificate either. At least you didn't, uh, I mean, your handprint or your footprint might be on there, but that was under duress. You, you had no knowledge of what was going on as a child, as an infant. That birth certificate is a contract that has nothing to do with you. It's assumed that you have something to do with it. We all assume these things. We assume the Constitution applies to us. But that's all it is, is an assumption. Contract is by consent. They sign an oath to uphold the Constitution against enemies, foreign and domestic. Well, good for them. That has nothing to do with me. As far as correct sentence structure goes, um, when you walk in and you start participating with those types of things, then you kind of put yourself under their jurisdiction. Have you ever submitted paperwork to the court, to a foreign vessel in dry dock? Think of the, what the word submit means. It means that you subordinated yourself to them. You came in under them you automatically put yourself at a disadvantage. Now it is their house. You are walking in, the place you're walking into is not yours. 
whether it's a foreign vessel in dry dock or whatever, it's not your building. You don't own it. You don't have anything to do with it. You are foreign to that building. So maybe going by what you just said, maybe the judge looks at you as a foreign enemy. Treason for what? Like treason, what, what treason? And this goes back to the Constitution. Did you put your signature on the Constitution? Are you a part of that contract? If the answer is no, then that contract literally has nothing to do with you. Literally. A contract is a contract. And it's by consent. It's assumed that you fall under the Constitution. And again, things like legal and laws, they, they don't pertain to correct sentence structure, communication, policy, syntax, grammar. If you decide to learn this grammar, you can establish your own jurisdiction that trumps everyone else's jurisdiction. And you can be your own authority, your own postmaster, bank banker, federal judge, whatever you want to call yourself. The point is, you can call yourself master of the universe or master of the cosmos if you want to. The point is, you have to be able to back it up. You have to be able to prove what it is you're saying. You have to be able to perform on your uh, claims. Like, my public claim is that I'm a correct sentence structure, communication, parsley, syntax, grammar tutor. I can prove it. I teach it. Look at my channel. Look at my TikTok. It's full of quantum grammar videos of me talking about quantum grammar. Look at my YouTube channel. Over 900 videos of me talking about correct sentence structure, communication, policy, syntax, grammar. So I can prove, I can back up what I'm saying. It's the same thing with you. If you're going to walk into a court or something like that and claim knowledge of, of a grammar technology, you better be able to teach that to other people. You better be able to prove that you know what it is you're talking about. Because if you can't and you get called to the carpet, it might not turn out the way you think it will. But you don't have to uh, ignore the system. Rather than be controlled by a fiction system, why not be a steward of your contracts? Why not become a live life claimant and become the authority of your biosphere and stop the trespass of the fiction system? The first claim I think I made in 2017, I think it was, this is before I even knew how to syntax 100%. It was against a state, uh, state tax entity where they were trying to come after me for uh, penalties, fees, interests on unpaid quote-unquote taxes. And so I syntaxed, to the best of my knowledge, the paperwork that they sent me, and I wrote out a correct sentence structure, document, contract, postal vessel court venue, uh, credentialing myself as a live life claimant. And I sent them, I think, a, a check for like a dollar or something like that. I said, I want to contribute to your state tax because I understand that road workers need paid, you know, people that work at electric companies and we need to maintain our highways and sidewalks and whatever. So here's my contribution to that. But you need to show me a correct contract for the rest of these penalty, penalties and interest fees and all this other stuff. In other words, I was saying, show me a correct contract or show me a quo rento or go on vacation. They decided to go on vacation. They actually sent me back a letter saying, that uh, the account is settled. They accepted my, whatever it was, $1 check and left me alone. Never heard from them again. 
And that is what bolstered my uh, enthusiasm in learning this grammar and why I started teaching it in February of 2018, because I figured that everybody would want to learn this. But I quickly found out that while everybody expresses excitement and interest in wanting to learn this, very, very few of them are actually willing to put the work in. Sentence structure won't do a damn thing if you're ignorant to what you're saying. Yes, I keep saying this over and over again. You have to know how to teach them. You have to know it well enough to teach a stranger under duress. You have to be able to teach this. If you write out a correct sentence structure document, you have to translate that into plain, simple English. <laughs> so there is no misunderstanding. You have to know it well enough to teach it. So it's true. It won't do a damn thing if they don't understand what you're saying. Actually, no. Stop and correct. That is not true. Because I have sent out claims where I didn't translate it, and it still worked. But you have a better chance of it working if you do translate it, for sure. Hi, is, does syntax work? What? Hi, is, does, sin. I don't know what that means. The syntax in the context that I'm talking about is spelled S-Y-N-T-A-X. Specifically. I don't know what S-I-N space T-A-X is. Yeah. All right, so... If you want to contact me to uh, apply for a workshop or a consultation, contact me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. Uh, what's the best way to learn? Well, that's funny that you say that because I'm telling you right now. Uh, well, I don't know if it's the best way to learn, but it's one way to learn. I've been teaching for six years now. I've taught hundreds of people. You can go over to my YouTube channel. Link in the bio. If you go to my bio, there will be a link to my YouTube channel. There are over 900 videos there. No secrets or tricks. It's all there. All you got to do is invest your time in it. Um, if you're really, really serious about it, email me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com, which that is also in my bio. And I'll set up a consultation for you, a 10 to 15 minute video consultation. There are no charges or fees for this video consultation. Um, you can ask me whatever you want to. And uh, it's just easier to talk that way on a video console. Also, please include your full correct name in your email. You know my full correct name, uh, Colin Jason, I've met you Colin Glass. You can uh, provide me the same consideration. I appreciate it. All right, so thanks for all the questions and the conversations. Appreciate that Gone Digital 80 and also uh, Kevin Broder. Appreciate the likes and the shares. If you would like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, I offer several choices. The first one, and the easiest one, is to study the almost 900 free public videos on this YouTube channel that you're watching right now. The second option, if you want to see new content, is to click the Join button on my main YouTube page or under any video that you're watching, click the join button and you will see two tiers of membership. If you choose the second tier, the loyalist contributor tier, and you join that for a monthly support donation, you'll get new content, fresh content, exclusive content not available to the public every month. But keep in mind, there's already almost 900 videos here free to the public to study. And the third option is to contact me at the email address at the bottom of your screen. And this is for the serious students only. And apply for a correct grammar workshop. But please include your correct name when contacting me. And I'll set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation. And you and I will have a conversation. You can ask me whatever you want. I'll answer your questions. I'll do the same with you. I'll ask you questions and we'll see if indeed you are really serious or not. Thank you.